it's divided, isn't it, in your house yeah. of what your your mum and dad want. Just share us, Very. share that with us. Yeah, my <laughs> my mum wants me to play for England. My my dad's Samoa shirt is back there in in the background. Um, he would love for me to play for New Zealand or some probably more New Zealand and Samoa just because of the struggles that they've been through in, in the recent in recent years. But you know, with the way that you have to be in New Zealand to play for New Zealand. It's a very difficult, very difficult thing to do. Um, but my brother just says, whoever you pay for, just get kit and I can I wear it. That's all he says. you might get sick of talking about but we have to because it is yeah. part of your story and part of your life so your dad played 13 times for Samo your, your dad might your uncle Tana 74 times for the All Blacks and are you cousins with the late Jerry Collins is that is that true or is that my yeah my dad thinks first cousin so somewhere like second or third cousin down the line yeah. I mean unbelievable pedigree <laughs> just, just in the name how in the law's name did you end up in Coventry of all places then <laughs> uh, so my dad came over to play for Halifax to start off with and then um, signed for Rotherham after that and then got a job down at Coventry. We moved down, lived in Kenilworth um, and then from there I just went to school around Kenilworth and and ended up um, at Leicester for a bit and then, <laughs> then coincidentally moved back to Coventry to play for Wasp. So I was living in Coventry for a little bit and yeah, it's, it's a nice area. To say. <laughs> no, I grew up in Coventry, mate. I know, I, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. What, part of, what part of Coventry was it? Mate, mine was, I'd say, more urban. So it was Radford area. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was a little bit more edgy. And I lived in Hill Fields for a bit, which is by the old oh. football stadium. I know. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> cultured. So I'm not your stereotypical what's classed as a middle class no, not rugby at player at private school. So I know Coventry very well. But... Um, it's class, actually, the way that things work out, right? The way that life goes. But the dynamics of your family, and it's probably something... Well, does it annoy you when you talk about it and when commentators will mention it? No. So you, you... No, no, I'm used to it now. And it's also, it's just my life. It's not really... It's quite yeah. a cool thing to talk about at times as well. Yeah, mate, it, it is class. What kind of influence was it then? Because if you were never going to be a rugby player, it would have been a travesty, right? So what kind of influence did your dad, did your uncle, and having a surname in which you have, and, you know, it's one of the greatest names in, in rugby, it really is, and, and that's credit to, to, to your family and what they've done in the game. But what kind of influence did they have on your career? Did you feel a pressure at all? Um... A little bit at school starting off because obviously, you know, kids can be pretty mean. And, you know, if I had a bad game, they'd be like, oh, your, your uncle's this, your dad's that. Um, but then as it got older and um, I kind of realised it, no one really cared about it as the older I got. Uh, it was actually interesting going out to New Zealand because, you know, you play over there, you play club rugby. It's like a National One equivalent. You've got an All Blacks third cousin and it's just kind of normal over there. So that was quite like, like interesting to find out um but they but my dad had a very big uh, impact on me my mum did as well because she played back in the day um I think I, I watched a lot I didn't watch my dad play I missed I missed out his career but I watched a lot of my uncle and um I mean it goes without saying he was a very good player so what and then you know my little brother still watches my uncle's highlights every now and again on 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 YouTube so they both had quite an impact yeah, it, mate, you, uh, that's what I mean. Your dad must hate it. Eh? I don't imagine there's many clips of the per 10 bees versus, um, versus Coventry, Not yeah, versus Coventry <laughs> or Nottingham on YouTube. But all you have to do is type in the surname, and then there's yeah. hundreds of hacker clips. How are the, how are the dynamics of, you, of, of your dad and your cousin? Because I know a lot of the, um, it's the way that life moves, right? So your dad obviously chose to play for Samoa, Tana, right place, right time, gifted human being to play with mm. the Blacks. How was that dynamics growing up? Were you, were you part of that? Were you privy to any of them kind of conversations that they had? Uh, not really. My dad got picked for someone quite late in his career anyway, but um, he um, he was just like, I'll go down this road, you go down that road. I think his dad wanted one of them to play for someone at least because he was he was born over there. So I think it was good to have for, for their parents. 
you know, one Samoan one international, one New Zealand international. Um, but I mean, it's kind of it just what happened, right time, right place, like you say, for for my uncle and my dad. He, he's still happy. He's played international rugby. He tells me every day, international rugby is international rugby. How many caps have you got? I can't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> Well, tell him I've got 63 caps for Scotland, mate, and uh, <laughs> apparently that's equivalent. It's not even equivalent to one all black caps. So <laughs> it, might be, it might be a couple of Samoa ones. Um, you mentioned going down to New Zealand. I actually played down in New Zealand for a year. I played in Christchurch at Marist Albion. I thought the club oh, yeah. was just, mate, it was ridiculously good. I just couldn't believe it. Is, it. Isn't it? Yeah, so, so good. Like the, ba- the basic skills, right? The, the tackling and the passing. Now, I know... Yeah. People listen to that will be like, well, everyone can tackle and pass, but no, not at the kind of level that no. you know the, 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 the New Zealand team set the bar. Were you ever tempted? I know you went you went there. Did you have any bigger opportunities to go down there? One for the namesake, but also your talent as well. And having had an influence of being in the academies over here and playing over here, surely there must have been or opportunity people coaching you to come back, especially as your career's progressed, yeah. progressed professionally. Yeah, there was a time I was speaking to the Auckland coaches again. I, I come back and I really, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, as I as I say, the longer I was like, you know, this kind of feels like home. You know, I'm with you know people that I, I like, I know. Um, but it was just had to happen that I, I played well at Wasps, and it was the best thing to do for my career was probably to stay here. But you know, as a kid, I always wanted to either wear a black shirt or a blue shirt. You know, internationally. Um, but, you know, international rugby, international rugby. So I think eventually I'd love to go back again and play. The Super rugby is always on my, my bucket list to play, but whether it happens or not, I'm not too sure. You mentioned what shirt you want to play. So it, is it, well, I know it is. I read an article. It's, it's divided, isn't it, in your house yeah. of what your, your mum and dad want. Just share, us, share that with us. Yeah, my, <laughs> my mum wants me to play for England. My, my dad's Samoa shirt is back there in, in the background. Um, he would love for me to play for New Zealand or some, probably more New Zealand than Samoa, just because of the struggles that they've been through in, in the recent in recent years. But you know, with the way that you have to be in New Zealand to play for New Zealand, it is a very difficult, very difficult thing to do. Um, but my brother just says, "Whoever you play for, just get kit." And I can I wear it? That's what he says. <laughs> That's kind of what. Uh, so your brother plays, does he? He's twelve. He's just he's just starting to play properly now. What position? Do you reckon? He says a 10 or a 12, and I reckon he's going to be better than me. He's quite big and quite you know, physical for his age. Mate, watch this space. It, uh, exactly. It should be class. Um, so talking about the white jersey, you've had a kind of taste of being in that kind of environment. How is that as a, as a young lad? Like, what, what are you like as a player? Are you a player that will go to the coaches and look for improvements and, and speak to them and see what they want? Or are you a player that kind of keeps your head down and just gets on with it day in, day out? A bit of both, really. I think if there's an, a very a big issue I want to work on, then I'll go to them. If not, I just kind of like to get do my own thing, keep my my own space. But the whole camp in general was was really good experience. I didn't I didn't expect obviously to be in it the first time round. I was very shocked, but just to have that experience was quite good. There's a lot of you know, a lot of good people to learn off in camp. So it's, as a young player, it's a no brainer, really. Yeah, hard. Hard in camp, is it like a massive step up under Eddie Jones? I hear all these things about how hard training is. Mm. And obviously it can be probably more like that than club rugby works week in, week out. But how much of a step up was it physically and mentally? Uh, yeah, massive. It's like, well, for the backs, I mean, it's not as bad as the forwards get absolutely beasted. Uh, we turn up at six, we have like an upper body uh, pump and they, they're on what bikes doing this doing that and I'm like I'm glad <laughs> glad I'm not a forward in that six system. in the morning six yeah, in the morning yeah six in the morning yeah yeah your dad will be like it should be in the evening it'll be six in the evening <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah um, but it's it's definitely I think that the big game training days we have you know there's there's nothing I've done like that before and it's everyone su- drives such a high standard that you know it forces you to go another gear as well yeah, and is it all? So you talk about the pe- the people driving. That's every, everything you hear now. You look at the very best teams. You look at the All Blacks from years gone by. It was very player driven. The England team that won it in two thousand three. From the gauge that I'm getting, I'm not expecting you to give too much away. But it, is it really player driven in, in training? Is that the big thing that you've noticed? Having been a having been a professional player, but playing ten, who needs to drive a team around? Are you noticing that the the the, the players in that England team are taking the lead when it comes to training? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You've got two you know, big characters in Faz and Fordy who just, you know, they're like coaches on the field anyway. So if, if stuff's not going right, you know, they hold very high standards as well. So 
they'll clamp down on it straight away. And then you've got people like Mako, who's very verbal as well. So it's definitely, it's like having coaches on the field, really. Yeah, no, it's class. Uh, what question I want to ask is, as a young man and a player, like we're, we're doing the interview now, mm. we've spoken about your family and stuff. What is it like being a professional sportsman now? Do you feel the pressure? Do you feel like there's this microscope on you that might not have been there a few years ago? How, you know, how do you deal with the profession? Uh, you know, the pressure of being a professional sportsman. It's it's quite cool. It's I think the the weirdest thing I've, I've recently experienced was my I have a there's a billboard outside the Rico with my face on it, and I was a bit like <laughs> I was like I, that shouldn't I shouldn't be there. Um, but I also get you know I get kids messaging me on on instagram like 14 50 year old kids like what can i do and i think it's pretty cool to be in a place where you can offer your advice and they you know they'll soak up everything you say so in that like i love that side of it 100 percent um obviously you are everything you do is is you know under the watchful eye of the public the rugby no, public anyway no absolutely well that brings me on to the kind of next question something again i wanted to speak to a player of your profile but your age being a millennial and the influence of social media, right? There's a lot of talk about this. Like I've built a brand on social media um, and you look now at athletes and you look now at rugby players, it's a kind of change of narrative of, 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 of what's been done in years gone by. And Instagram seems to be like the biggest platform that players are going down to build a profile. It's interesting you mentioned that. You actually don't post a lot of rugby footage. Like I went through your Instagram earlier today if you post a, a, a picture of you playing rugby or if any of the players do, it gets huge interaction. Do you want to do that? Is it something that you want to do? Do you want to build a brand? Do you see the value in that? And like, do your family or, you know, your agent push you to try and build this kind of brand away from playing? Um, not really. I've, I've not ever really been big on social, like my Twitter. I don't really tweet that much, like actual tweet. I like to retweet a bit, but um, I think, I just like to, you know, share what I think is, you know, close to my heart. If it's a picture of me playing rugby or a picture of me and my family or my girlfriend, whatever, um, I'd rather post something like that than, you know, constantly posting, you know, loads of posts. Um, and I think also that everyone sees what's going on. It's nice to, you know, keep some sort of private life if you're not posting what's happening 24-7, which is, you know, a lot of people are always stalking uh, a, lot, a lot of people out there. Um, but... I think it's such a massive thing. Social media these days, you just got to be careful at times. Yeah. And then finally, there's a lot of stuff out there in the media, isn't there, about how brutal the game of rugby is and has been in, in recent times. Like, I'm not asking you to comment on that whatsoever, but as a young player, and we know that the retirement age is getting younger and younger, um, are you looking to... Like, how difficult is it to look towards the future for when you're 35 and to take your eye off the ball of what you're doing now, of training as hard as you can, being as good as you can be, being in the England camp, driving a team around the pitch, with also in the back of your mind, knowing that one day it's going to come to an end. And I'm sure with your, you know, with your uncle, but your dad as well, there's a realism that life isn't going to be as glory as it is now playing professional rugby. Do you think about that as a young lad? Is that something in the back of your mind? Yeah, uh, quite a lot, actually, I think. Um because I'm quite big into coaching, so I've just started doing that. My dad uh, works at university, so he's like, you know, make sure you've got a plan in place. My mum's very onto that sort of stuff. So I've got a good support system around to where that if I if I feel like I need to sort that stuff out, they'll be onto me straight away, which is good. I, I think a lot of people probably more so now have it. I think there was a, probably 10, 15 years ago, I don't think there was as much support for after, for post-rugby stuff, but I think now... I think a lot more people have caught on to how quickly you can kind of go down the drain, so to say, after after rugby that a lot of people are helping out. I watched Trevor Liotta's Oceans Apart. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, he was like, I've lost, you know, I've got nothing. I've lost my wife. I've lost all my money. So, you know, it, uh, a lot of people are helping out. That's all, that's all I can say. No, absolutely, mate. Good on you. It's great that you've got that support uh, system around you, but you're also switched on. That's class. And um, lastly... Yes. So this season's obviously mental, right? Well, uh, you can see that from the outside. There's games upon games. What does it look like for you personally, I suppose, collectively? You know, have you set any goals out for this year? And um, well, how does that look going forward as a club? You know, what, what, are the, um, what are the expectations, you know, realistically? Yeah, so obviously we're, we're looking to try and get back to where we, we were last year. I think, you know, top four to, to fight out for that top two, like, getting to that final again would be massive because it's such a long season as well, I think. 
how we started last year. And we started you know, quite not the best this year. We had two bad games. I think it was Gloucester and Newcastle game, but we're on we're on the up now. We know it's a long season, so you know you could lose like we did like five games, six games in a row, and still be in in the final. So there's that's our goal, the top four. But on a personal note, I'm I'm trying to aim for fifty games for Wasp this year. That's that's my goal. Fifty. Fifty. I'm on thirty three. Oh, okay. Like yeah. I was gonna say I, th- I thought you Not were straight about 50. 50 games. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got 30, so I've got 17 more games to go. Um that would be a purse like a, a real big milestone for me. So that's what I'm aiming for. And England? Uh, if it if it happens, it happens. I was shocked the first two times I got picked, so I'd still be shocked if I keep getting picked. No, you keep going for it. Uh Jacob Wagner, mate, pleasure speaking to you as a as a, as a young lad. Appreciate that, mate. Thanks very much. Thank you.